Zumba or aerobics, or interested in spending hours walking on a treadmill or sitting on a stationary bike. The I Can Do program will teach you how to use the walking cane as a tool for exercise and self-defense. The program will also introduce you to new ways of dealing with limiting thoughts, thus helping you to stay motivated to continue working out, which will enable you to maintain a great quality of life. While the I Can Do TV show is a great start, it isn't a replacement for quality instruction from a certified instructor. Now, let's get started. I want to quickly cover with you what we're going to do with the cane at points when we're not using the cane for exercises. And you would also use this at times whether you're in the store or even around the home, when you need both hands for doing something, but you want to keep your cane close to you. Your first choice is hooking your cane in your pocket, or hooking it in your waistband or your belt. And the reason for this is because if something does happen, and someone starts coming for you, you can grab for the cane immediately and be ready to deal with them. But at the same time, when you need your hands free, they're free. It's, think of it as the old West style kind of quick draw of the pistol. It's the quick draw for your cane. Today, Bob and I have a special guest with us, Colleen, who will be helping us to demonstrate some of the activities throughout this episode. So let's get ready and let's start working out. Let's move on now to warming up our wrists. Let's go ahead and hook our cane in the belt or into our pocket. We're going to do a wrist stretch, so put your palm up, place your hand on top of the palm, put your thumb in the crease, and then you're going to bend your hand down. Now, if this is an intense enough stretch at this point, stay here. If not, then start to straighten your arm to intensify the stretch. What we're doing is we're stretching the ligaments in the wrist and the forearms. We want to, again, as I've said in many episodes before, be gradual, be gentle, especially on our wrist stretch. Now, we're going to hold this for about 30 seconds, and then we're going to switch it over. So the top hand is still doing the same thing. The only change now is the position the palm is down. And we're now getting this top part of the forearm and the wrist. Now, you may find, if you have arthritis in your wrist, you may find that this is painful in here. Stop where you feel the pain and just hang out there. Don't try and force past it. Just hang out right on the, the fringe, the edge. Okay, if you haven't already, go ahead and change hands. Again, get this area of the forearm, the ligaments in the wrist, the tendons. All right. Breathe deep and breathe slow. And then switch it over. Get the back side of the arm. And this is really, this stretch is really important, both palm up and palm down. If you have carpal tunnel or any kind of issues in the wrist, doing this gently every day, at least a couple times a day, you will find that those issues tend to go away. All right? And so now let's get ready for our next exercise after you shake out your wrists. Now we're going to warm up our wrists. We're going to grab the cane in a mid shaft grip and we're going to do the single hand cane rotation. So we're going to start out, if you watch Bob here, where it's just palm up, palm down, up, down. Do not push past that at this point. You've got to give the muscles, you've got to give the 
ligaments and the tendons the time to kind of get warmed up. So look at it as doing about 10 and then move your hand back to the elbow where you start to allow yourself to go deeper. Now at home you may not be able to see this but what's happening is Bob is allowing these three fingers to relax on the cane as he's doing the rotation. So he's still warming up the ligaments but he's not over rotating them and he's helping to practice his ring that we've mentioned in past episodes. This ring is important because it's what you use to control your cane when you have to use your cane for self-defense. And now Bob's going to change hands and he's going to do 10 with palm up, palm down and then he's going to go back behind the elbow and then eventually to the shoulder. Now when working with your cane you always want to make sure to warm the wrists up. That's why in every episode we always have a stretch to warm the wrists up to get it going before we go into doing any of the techniques. All right. So at home, do this as well. Now, in time, you're going to find that this also is usable in other ways, and we'll cover that in other episodes. And then when Bob is done, he's going to shake it out. And, okay. He's up to nine. He's up to ten. And now he's going to shake it out. We're going to now warm up our spine with twist. We're going to get our core going. So we're going to bring the cane up, we're going to have our feet about shoulders width apart, and we're going to start to turn. Alright? Turning back and forth. Now, we do this, uh, this twist in every single episode because it's very important. It warms up your entire core in one nice shot. Now, I do want to point out again that when we're doing the twist, we want the heel to rotate to come up off the ground as we twist because that allows us to follow through and protect the spine. We want to keep it protected. The idea is to not torque the spine, to twist it in any way. You're going to find that over time you're going to aggravate your back. You're going to cause yourself to have back issues if you do this exercise repetitively but keep your heels planted. Okay. Now we can do it a little faster to really get the blood going, to really get the circulation going. Okay? And as we do this, try and practice letting your arms relax. So it's the momentum of the hips turning that allow the arms to move. It feels like your arms are being pulled. All right? Breathe nice and slow as you do this. And then go ahead and you stop. Shake it out. Let's move to warming up our back now. We're going to do the double handed cane rotation. So we're going to bring the cane up like this and we're going to turn it as if we're, we're turning a wheel. So you're going to rotate your hands like this. Now you notice how I can bring my elbows together but Colleen doesn't. And that's okay because what's happening is I'm going to where I can go. She's going only as far as she can go. At home, go to where you start to feel the stretch and just hang out there. Now, as we're doing this, we're going to turn, we're going to breathe in, and then as we exhale, rotate to the other side. Now, I'm going to have Colleen turn around, and as she's doing this, I want you to notice how as she breathes in, she expands her back with the breath, and then on the exhale, you see her back gets smaller. The idea is you're stretching out the back even more by getting a deeper breath. This helps you to get a better breath even while stressed. If you start chest breathing, okay, now turn around. The other thing to note is as you do this, you don't want your head to be leaning. You want your, your spine to stay straight and you're stretching off of the straight spinal column. All right. It's a way of protecting your, your spine and keeping the back safe. And then slowly stop, release one of the hands, and shake it out. It's now time to stretch out our legs. We're going to do a new hamstring stretch called the triangle stretch. It's a variation of a yoga stretch. What I'm going to have Bob do is he's going to step and he's going to form 
the tripod, but not as deep as we would for the hip flexor stretch. The front leg is going to be relatively straight. You can have a slight bend in it, but I'll explain that in a moment. He's going to, while standing straight, he's going to arch his back, so you feel your back muscles engaged. However, he's going to start leaning forward as if he's trying to put his chin to the other wall. Okay, and so now all of a sudden that balances out the back. He's going to rock his hips back, intensifying the stretch. Now the thing is, if he had a straight leg at this point, he would be feeling the stretch in the back. He'd be feeling the stretch back here on his leg. Okay, we don't want to do that. All right, now to shift, he's going to come up first. Okay, and then as you notice, when he came up, he used his hands on his leg and his cane to push himself up. He did not use his back to come up. Okay, and so he's again leaning forward, trying to reach the other wall. Now, getting back to what I was saying about the slight bend to the leg, if we have the slight bend, to the knee, just a slight bend, we move the stretch from the back of the knee into the hamstring itself. That's where we want it. Because if we do stretch the back of the knee, we're stretching connective tissue, the ligaments and the tendons, in a way they weren't really designed to stretch. We reduce the stability of the knee. We increase our chances of re-injuring it if we already have an injury. And so now Bob's going to come up, again, pushing with his hands and not using his back to come up. And he's going to shake it up. And we're going to get ready for our next exercise. Now we're going to work on strengthening the legs and practicing a stance at the same time. I'm going to have Bob get into a back stance. This is where what you're doing is you're sort of forming an L with your feet. You're bending both your knees and you're sinking your weight back onto the back leg. So that if someone were to come up and actually hook and pull your leg, it could move easily. Alright? So now I'm going to have Bob switch sides. Work the other leg. Again, work to maintain balance. Strengthening this leg. You can kind of almost see it quivering over here. Okay? And again, if someone were to sweep the leg, your leg would come up easily. All right, the back stance. In this part of the show, we're going to work on building a foundation that will help us with our kicks. So we're going to work on the side leg raisers. I'm sure you've seen this in Pilates and in, in some yoga classes and dance classes. You're going to do 10 per side, but you're going to do as Bob is doing. You're going to raise the leg straight out from the side. You're going to have your leg completely locked. Okay, the idea is you're working the hip flexors, I'm sorry, the abductors, sorry for getting that part wrong, and your obliques. After you've done 10, you switch sides, okay, but keep your toes pulled back. You see how his toes are pulled back that if he were actually doing a kick, his foot's in the same position as the side kick, all right? And then once he's done with 10, he shakes it out. In this self-defense technique, we're going to deal with what happens if somebody rushes you from behind. Okay? And some women have experienced this. Uh, we won't go into, of course, details about you know, what happens after. But if the person comes from you behind, they're going to grab and they're going to try and push you to the ground. So as they're pushing, you go with the force. You don't fight it, but you step one foot out and plant it. Wrap the hands around your antagonist and then hit him hard in the leg, okay? Because what's happening is, again, when you're having a full swing into the, the thigh, you're going to make it so they cannot chase you, you're going to cause them a lot of pain, you're going to be able to get away. And if you want to, you can do a follow-up technique. So once again, when they come, you push, you step, wrap around, hold tight, so that they have to really pull hard to get out, right? And then hit him in the leg, okay? Now this is all happening in real time, so what's going to happen is they're going to be hitting the leg before they even have a chance to get their hands out. So one last time. All right? I push, she wraps around, and hit the leg. Now I'm going to have Colleen show you what it would look like to train by yourself at home. She's going to turn around, grab, 
and hit the leg. Boom. Okay? You want to practice, as Colleen did, that step. Okay? You want that to be instinctive. So once again, she's going to step, wrap, hit. Boom. Practice this technique over and over again until it becomes instinctive and natural. And practice with both hands. We're going to be learning a self-defense technique now where we're going to use our torso block and then we're going to turn it into actually taking the opponent down to the ground. Now, I'm not going to have Bob take me all the way to the ground as we demonstrate this technique. Well, one, because we're on tile, and two, because it's just not all that fun to roll around on the ground after a certain age. All right, so I'm going to have Bob face me. Okay, now remember the torso block, come up into the torso block, is the two hands, okay? You're creating a very strong block. So the punch is coming and he torso blocks. Now he's going to take the shaft of the cane and he's going to bring it behind my neck. Now you see he's put his foot on the outside of my leg and he's going to pull me down, not towards him, but like he's rolling. So his shoulders are going to turn. Okay? And as you can see, by doing that, it puts the opponent off balance. And once a person's even slightly off balance, from there it's so much easier to get them to move. By his putting his foot on the outside of my leg, got to work better on the cues, uh, on the outside of my leg, okay, the instinct when someone's pulling you is to step, to kind of counterbalance. But if his foot's here, I go to step, there's something blocking me, so I can't step. My mind all of a sudden gets split in my attention. It's like, why can't I step? Oh, wait, I'm falling. And so your opponent is going to fall. So the technique, again, the bad guy punches, you block. Okay, now Bob is stopping himself because he didn't step properly. In a real fight, you, if you don't step properly, you don't have that choice. Complete the technique. Okay, so block and take the opponent down. Okay. Now we're going to switch angles, okay? So, again, I throw the punch, Bob steps to the outside of the foot, so you can see now how he's trapping my leg, and he pulls, and I go. It's not allowing my leg to, it's not allowing my leg to, to really do anything to keep me up. And so what ends up happening is your opponent's going to fall. So one last time, block, step, and pull, down I go. Now, to practice this at home without a training partner, your Bob's going to do the torso block, he's going to step, behind the head, and row him down. Okay? Again, step, behind the head, and row him down. Practice that over and over again so it becomes instinctive. Alright? Torso block's a very strong block. This pull from behind the head, it's, a, it's an easy pull, but it's a strong pull. This next self-defense technique, it's along the same lines as the one we just did. But instead of doing a torso block, you're going to do a reverse torso block. And we're going to have a different surprise for them. In fact, you know what? I call this one the Christmas special. And yes, I am working with a king rat here. So I'm going to throw a punch. He's going to torso block, and then he's going to come up and kick towards the groin. Now again, he's being nice because I really like making these shows, and I don't want to be my last, so he's not kicking at the full target, okay, but you want to kick at the groin, okay, boom, into the groin, block, into the groin, block, into the groin, okay, so what's happening is he's taking the energy of blocking, so his body's turning this way and he's transferring it into the leg, so the idea is you're making so your opponent doesn't have enough time to do a counterattack. So again, boom, the opponent's now worried about what's going on down here, even if you miss your target. Now, in some martial arts systems, they teach you to pull the toes back for the kick. All right? And that's great, that works. The ball of the feet are very strong. However, there are some styles, like in Praying Mantis Kung Fu, where they'll teach you to kick with the toes, actually as a knife, or the top of the foot. For the groin, going with the top of the foot is going to actually really compress them and crush them. Okay? So what this looks like without a training partner, go ahead, he's going to do the reverse torso block and kick. Again, reverse torso block and kick. One more time. 
Practice this at home. I can't say that enough in these episodes. The more you practice at home, the more instinctive they become, the easier the techniques will be. We really enjoy bringing these shows to you. And we'd really love to hear from you to find out your thoughts about the show. Find out what we can do better and, and what parts you like. Because right now we are sort of doing it within a vacuum. Uh, we don't know if you're really enjoying you know, the interchange between uh, the cast or if you'd prefer to go back to just me. So if you could send us an email, um, and the email will be on the bottom of the screen, or like us on Facebook um, and message us, you know, however you want to communicate with us, um, we'd love to hear from you and, and let us know what we can do to make the show better. Today's episode, we're going to focus on being grateful for our abilities to, to do work. Now, for some people, they think in terms of like going to a job, and that, that's part of it. But also part of it is like the work we can do around the house, the things that we're able to engage and do. Now, I know some people don't think work is fun, but when you're no longer able to do things for yourself, you all of a sudden start to realize what it meant to be able to wash the dishes or to be able to go into the office, even if you don't necessarily like where you work, just have that, well, that luxury of being able to go into the office and perform the skills that you actually are quite proficient at. So take a moment and imagine you have a, a manager following you around. And this manager is he's watching for anything and everything that you do to let you know how great you're doing it and how thankful that, that they are, that you're there to do it. And so as you're, well, let's say you're walking the dog or doing the dishes or you're at the office and you're handling customers or writing a program, take a moment and imagine your manager saying thank you. We are grateful for your being here and doing this job. Now, you're going to find that you're going to have more and more things to feel grateful for. Don't just focus on the big things. Focus on even the small things. Like if you were to bring your, your, your partner a, a cup of coffee, or make dinner, or help out somebody up the stairs at work carrying something. Small thing, but it's still something that you should be thankful that you're able to engage in and do. Take everything that there is and find a way to be thankful for it. Like in the exercises that we do. When you're going through and practicing the exercises, imagining my being there with you, thanking you for putting the time and the effort in to train and to continue to grow. And thank you for watching the show. Thank you for being, being part of our audience. These are all things that you should take some time and thank yourself for. Because I definitely appreciate your being here. Like us on Facebook. I can do. Facebook or Bob gets it.